Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's COVID-19 office hours. I'm going to spend just a moment going over some technical notes, and then we'll turn it over to the team for today. Just as a quick heads up, we do intend to go the full 90 minutes today. So uh, record the session is being recorded, and we will post a copy of that recording along with the slides and a, cap a copy of the content from chat to the HUD exchange um, at the link that's posted up there on your screen right now. Just give us a few business days, and we promise that it will be there. If you have audio issues at any point throughout the webinar, we do encourage you to switch over to phone audio as that tends to be a little more stable during the webinar. And you can do that by at any time um, dialing in on the information that's up there on your screen. And we'll be sure to put that in the chat in just a moment as well. We do hope to hear from everyone uh, throughout the webinar. So on the next slide, we'll see some information on how best to do that. To connect with us, please look on your screen right now, all the way over to the right hand side, you should see as it's highlighted in that little red box right now, what looks just like a chat box. If you click on that, it'll open up the chat functionality for you in WebEx. Please send all questions, comments, or feedback in through chat. When you are sending us those messages though, just take a moment to make sure that they're getting sent to everyone. That's the best way to ensure that they get to not only all attendees, um, but to all the panelists that we have today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Karen de Blasio from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. Karen? Thank you, Natalie. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Good to see everybody and see everybody in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, we have, a, as Natalie said, we plan on going 90 minutes today. Um, Norm is not with us, unfortunately. We let him take a couple days off, um, so he is out of the office, but happy Friday to you all and welcome to the office hours. Um, we have a great team of um, people on the call today. Uh, you have myself, obviously, Karen de Blasio, I'm the division director in the SNAPS office, Marlisa Gro Grogan, Sharon Singer, Brett Esders, William Snow. Um, these are all folks that are usually behind the scenes answering your questions in the, in the chat. Um, we have uh, Lisa Kaufman as well. She's in the SNAPS office and she's um, helps us answer a lot of questions. And we have a special SNAPS guest today, Lisa Mitchell Gaskew. Um, she's going to be talking to us about some indirect cost, uh, an indirect cost toolkit that recently came out. We also have some of our great TA providers, Michelle Budzik from the Partnership Center, Jonathan Sherwood from the Cloudburst Group, and David Canavan from Canavan Associates. Um, they, you see most of them up the top of your screen and they will also be answering questions and facilitating some conversation. We are very lucky to have today some folks from the city of Detroit, from the Pope Francis Center. We, as you know, we love to bring you guys, um, we, we love to have your peers on here and let you guys listen to how they're, um, you know, working on things in their community. So we have Stacy Conwell-Lee um, and we also have Dr. Ann Blake. Um, next slide, please. We also, um, I'll be handing it over in a minute to our um, uh, Lindsay Branco from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have Barbara DiPietro, who's um, in the background answering questions from the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. And we also have um, Dina Hushar and Jillian Weber also in the background answering questions in the chat um, for Department of Veterans Affairs. So um, I wanna thank everybody that makes this happen every week. Um, and I wanna um, go ahead and kick it right over to, um, uh, sorry, Lindsay, <laughs> couldn't remember who was next. Go ahead, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. This is Lindsay Branco uh, with the COVID-19 and Homelessness Unit at CDC. Uh, next slide. So uh, hopefully we're still seeing um, a low plateau of, of COVID-19 cases. Um, as of March 17th, there have been approximately 29.5 million cumulative cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. So this graph shows you the daily trends um, in COVID-19 cases reported to CDC with the blue bars showing the daily cases and the red line is the average number of cases over the last seven days. Um, as a reminder, it is still very important to continue following CDC recommendations related to the prevention of COVID-19 spread, such as wearing masks and distancing. Uh, next slide. 
We're continuing to see an increase in the percentage of population that's received at least one dose of vaccine. We're up to 22.2% of the U.S. population. Um, and this map shows the number of total COVID-19 vaccine doses administered per 100,000 uh, people per state. Overall, approximately 75.5 million people have received at least one dose of vaccine. Uh, and the states with the darkest shading have administered at least 45,000 doses per 100,000. So just to note that, um, that that number increases so the colors don't necessarily track from week to week. Um, next slide. I just want to raise everyone's awareness that the interim guidance for testing in homeless shelters and encampments was updated this week. Um, and that update included uh, additional description of tests that are available, testing scenarios, um, and how to apply the phases of community guidance and transmission. It also um, better aligns with some of the overall testing guidance. Um, so uh, this is the link to see that updated guidance. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, next slide. I did want to mention also that um, as the testing guidance refers to the levels of community transmission. So I wanted to raise everyone's awareness of this resource on the COVID data tracker that lets you look up the current level of community transmission in your county. Um, and so the link here, and you can look up um, whether or not it's high, substantial, moderate, or low. So this could be a useful resource as you're looking at the updated testing guidance uh, in collaboration with your public health partners. Next slide. Uh, one of the MMWR releases this week uh, focuses on county level vaccination coverage and social vulnerability. Um, I think as everyone on the phone probably knows, COVID-19 has a disproportionately affected is, uh, racial and ethnic minority groups and persons who are economically and socially disadvantaged. Um, and unfortunately, this report shows that in the first two and a half months of the vaccine program, high social vulnerability counties have lower COVID-19 vaccination coverage than did low social vulnerability counties. Um, so although there was a, a variability across the states, the disparities in vaccination coverage were observed in the majority of states. So what this really tells us is we just need to continue monitoring vaccination coverage by social vulnerability um, so that we can make sure that we're developing tailored local vaccine administration and outreach efforts that are reducing COVID-19 vaccination inequities. So the full report is available um, at the link as well if you want to read more. Next slide. Um, so again, this is uh, the same slide as last week, but just a, a reminder again that we do have vaccination resources, um, both uh, for this specific population as well as just generally. So um, please know that we have frequently asked questions um, as well as guidance for um, health departments as and homeless service providers. So, and I will turn it back over to you, Karen. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I want to next hand it over to um, another snapper, um, April Mitchell Gaskew. She is going to um, talk to us during our TA product spotlight and talk to us about the indirect cost toolkit for COC and ESG programs that was just released. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate um, the spotlight here on this topic. Um, Welcome to our first resource spotlight uh, from the Office of Special Needs Assistance Program. April Mitchell, I'm in the SNAP's office as a SNAP specialist. Um, I'm the SME for, for this topic. I'm joined today with Jonathan Sherwood. Um, he is the HUD compliance expert at CloudBurst. He and a numerous amount of TA providers helped to weigh in and get this document to where it is. Get it that we have much appreciations uh, for them. So like I said, today we'll be talking about the indirect cost toolkit for the continuum of care and ESG uh, programs. Um, 
this toolkit also applies to the uh, Youth Homeless Administration Program. So if you have questions about that, it applies because the YSDP program um, abides by the COC regulations. So um, again, thank you to your uh, to these audience members that are here. Some of you, I'm sure, submitted AAQs over the last several years. Um, if there are any HUD field office staff, HUD headquarters staff um, on the line, thank you. You have passed any questions. We have answered and pondered over um, some scenarios and questions, and so that um, has helped to inform this document uh, greatly. All of your contributions, feedback uh, were invaluable and definitely appreciated. Um, just to set a couple of expectations for today, um, we're going to walk through the content of the document and not necessarily attempt to answer um, organizations specific questions. So I know you out there, you may have some questions that are lingering out there, but today we're going to just walk through the document, talk about um, the various topics, and um, you can submit your AAQs um, um, at the HUD exchange like normal, and we will definitely try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, if you have questions that mm, that you've been pondering out there, you can also see your local CPA um, or your financial management guru with your organization and get the party started there. Next slide. So this toolkit was released uh, just this month, um, but this toolkit is as current as November 2019, and it does not include recent changes from the uniform administrative requirements uh, that were released back um, back in the fall of uh, this past year in 2020. Um, this resource is prepared by technical assistance providers and intended to provide guidance. Uh, the contents of the document, except when uh, they're based out of statutory regulatory um, authority of law, they do not have the force and effect of law that are not meant to, buy, to bind the public in any way. Um, so in other words, this document is to help facilitate the conversation and answer questions and give guidance um, to your organizations and not necessarily, they will, this guidance will not trump what is already out there. Um, as I said before, this is this document uh, goes along for the CLC and ESG programs and YHDP programs and any other programs that might be um, administered out of those regulations. Um, we talk about how they how indirect costs can be um, calculated and charged under these programs. Um, recipients can use this toolkit to make informed decisions concerning the best method of computing and seeking reimbursement for, re for indirect costs under the programs I just mentioned. Um, in 2014, the United States uh, Office of Management and Budget OMB released final regulations on the indirect cost under the Uniform Administrative Requirements, uh, cost principles, and audit requirements of the federal, uh, for federal awards. Um, this is known as the Uniform Administrative Requirements, or folks use shorthand and say 2 CFR 200. This is where all this indirect cost information is based out of. These regulations explain that uh, recipients or sub-recipients of indirect costs are legitimate expenses and that they need to be in re re in re reverse, be reimbursed sorry, for organizations to uh, be sustainable and effective. Um, when you look at the toolkit, you'll see us reference the term non-federal uh, entities. Non-federal entities also mean um, any entity that is not the federal government. So we'll also say in our COC programs, recipients or sub-recipients. Those are also called um, non-federal entities in the actual regulations. So non-federal entities administering uh, federal funds are not required to seek recovery and reimbursement for indirect costs related to uh, their federal awards. However, if a non-federal entity does decide to seek reimbursement for indirect costs, the uniform administrative guidance requires pass-through agencies um, or our grantees, typically states and local governments, and all, all federal agencies to reimburse a recipient or subrecipient for their indirect costs. So you don't have to um, use indirect costs in your organization, but if you choose to, it just says the federal government has to, has to accept that. So there are several methods for determining allocation and charging indirect costs, um, and these are the type of methods that we'll discuss in the toolkit. 
Um, and in particular, the toolkit will help the ESG and COC recipients and sub-recipients sub understand the requirements for different ways they can charge the grant um, for indirect costs within their programs. So we try to cater this toolkit for our specific programs. There are loads of organizations that will have various information based on based on what their regulations and their policy tells you. So we try to kind of cater this document um, specifically to us. And again, um, this toolkit does not replace anything that's in 2 CFR 200. <clears throat> Next slide. So how do you use this toolkit? Um, this toolkit uh, contains lots of general information regarding the treatment of direct and indirect costs. Uh, the determination and allocation of the direct and indirect costs are at the program and agency level. It's dependent upon uh, just different factors. Um, it's going to depend on uh, your size of your organization, the types of programs you have, the complexity of your structures. Um, it's also going to uh, depend on your overall approach to financial management. Um, so you're going to see lots of different topics, and you'll just be able to take that information and cater it to your specific generation, uh, um, your specific organization. Um, and hopefully, this document will help you along the way. Next slide. So one of the main topics we'll talk about um, in the toolkit is what are indirect costs and what are direct costs. Um, we'll talk about example costs um, and then allowability of costs. Um, just to give a little bit of information, cost objectives means a program, function, activity, award, organizational subdivision, contract, or work unit for which the cost data are desired and for which the provision is made to accumulate and measure the cost processes, jobs, capital projects, and et cetera. The Uniform Administrative Guidance defines these as direct cost. Um, those costs that are direct are ones that can be identified specifically to one cost objective. So for ESG and COC, you'll find a lot of the uh, costs are going to be direct costs um, and are exclusively used for the program, meaning like a case manager, salary, rental assistance for clients, purchase of, of food um, at shelters. But in, uh, on the opposite side, um, and in contrast, indirect costs are costs that are incurred for a common or a joint process um, in the office. Um, so those purposes benefiting more than one cost objective and not readily assigned to one cost objective um, specifically. These costs are shared by more than one program um, and understanding the distinct, the, the distinct uh, differences between direct and indirect costs, that's going to be one of your main keys when you start talking at your organization or if you're already in conversation, understanding what are those things that are directly uh, related to the program versus a joint or common indirect cost. Next slide. One of the other topics that we'll talk about in the toolkit is what are the options uh, for the reimbursement of indirect costs? And we've received loads of questions um, about, about just that. Um, the toolkit will primarily focus on providing organizations with information um, on the use of potential benefits and the requirements of the different reimbursement options. Um, so for the FY 2015 grants and beyond, um, they are eligible to use the 10% de minimis rate um, and are held to the Uniform Administrative uh, Guidance outlined under 2 CFR 200. For ESG, FY 2014 grants and beyond, they're eligible to use uh, this guidance. So within this third section of the document, we're going to talk about the 10% de minimis rate, which folks have emailed and asked lots of questions about. Which are going to talk about the eligibility criteria for the 10% de minimis rate. Um, we're going to really talk about and dive into the modified total direct cost. Some will say MTDC for shorthand, um, and that's going to be the 10% of the de minimis rate. So that'll be lots of fun uh, for you financial folks out there to be able to understand, okay, well, what's this total, um, this modified total direct cost versus, like, can I just use 10% of my overall budget? Um, so look right into that document and it'll give you some really good tips on, on what to do. Uh, we're also going to talk about indirect cost rate agreements. 
cost allocation plans, allowable cost allocation methods, um, whether it's going to be the simple allocation method, multiple rate allocation method, or the direct allocation method. So all of that's going to be described uh, within the document. So again, uh, a local uh, certified public accountant, CPA, can help your organization determine which rate is, is best for you. Um, organizations sometimes and typically cannot select and implement a negotiated indirect cost rate without the assistance of a CPA or an accountant, um, particularly one who is familiar with federal cost principles and uh, the uniform administrative guidance. Um, and so recipients and subrecipients are ultimately responsible for ensuring the compliance uh, with applicable regulations and policies, but these entities, these organizations, these CPAs, they can definitely help you along and get you on the right way. The fourth topic um, in this toolkit is, well, what is what, what is the best option for my organization? So we'll talk about what things you should consider when you're selecting an indirect cost rate option. Uh, we're going to talk about pros and cons, um, the different cost rate methods, and then different steps for choosing an indirect cost rate methodology. Next slide. Oh. Next, and one of the last, the last uh, biggest topics in the document that we'll cover are how are indirect cost uh, reimbursed options calculated? So you'll see in the document there will be lots of um, examples, some charts that kind of give you some ideas about what to consider. And again, these charts and these different pieces of information are there for you to consider, um, look back to your organizational structure, program, and policies, and then make decisions on what's best. Um, this guidance just basically gives you some samples, some examples on how to go. Um, so the topics that will be included are to calculate and use the 10% de minimis rate, um, ESG, de minimis cost rate, uh, indirect cost rate calculation examples, some COC de minimis rate indirect cost uh, calculation examples, which I think you guys will enjoy, um, negotiate and use the indirect cost rate, submission of the proposal, approval of the proposal, and um, disputes. And then we'll talk about how do you prepare and use a cost allocation plan. So once you, once you read the document and having understand all the various um, applicable methods for determining indirect costs, um, we will, uh, you, will sh you should be able to walk away with a good idea of how to begin practicing these uh, reimbursement options um, in your organization. And that, that's the main cue. Uh, next slide. And again, um, you guys, folks in the audience, field office, headquarters staff, um, you've asked so many questions that we thought were pertinent and common to some other organizations that we were able to create a FAQ document in the back of the, of the uh, toolkit. And we've got some definitions that um, came across our way over the years, and we thought we would define them for you. So in the toolkit, you'll see all that information. Um, next slide. And when you go to our website, you'll be able to see this document on the HUD Exchange Resource Library. You see the blue link highlighted there. I can add it. Uh, we can add it to the chat here. Um, if you have additional questions, I would advise for you to um, talk to your local CPA or your local accountant. Um, and if you are not sure which way to go, you can always send us a question to the AAQ. Um, there will be some questions that we already have answers to, but if there are some more complex ones, we may have to take them in consideration and get back to you, which may take a little time, but we'll definitely get back to you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And that is all we have for this spotlight. Karen, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you to everybody that took part in getting this toolkit together. This was a long time coming, and I know we were all very excited when it was finally released. So um, what I'd like to do, you can go to the next slide. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, turn it over to some of our partners in uh, Detroit. Um, as I said earlier during the introductions, we have, we're very lucky to have um, some folks on here to talk about their vaccine rollout. Dr. Ann Blake from Pope Francis Center. 
and Stacy Conwell Lee from the city of Detroit. Um, I will say that we were having some technology challenges with um, Ms. Conwell Lee, so I think that um, we're going to turn it over to her, but um, she'll need to be unmuted. I'm not sure if she's able to see the slides or not, so we might want to advance the slide and then we can unmute her and hopefully this all works. Sharon, I, I'm Are actually, you uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, super. Well, so I'm very disappointed that you can't see me because this is the most dressed up <laughs> I've been in. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a disappointment, but we'll, we'll get through it. Um, I would just like to start, before we dive in, I'd like to give a quick shout out to my colleague, Lauren Licata, who is out on medical leave, but has been an essential part of our vaccine rollout in general, and in this presentation in particular. And I just want to wish her a full and speedy recovery. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to tell a story. On Friday, January 8th at 3.30, I was sitting in a HUD office hours webinar, much like you all are today. The topic was COVID vaccine rollout, and it was incredibly informative. I had copious notes and was energized and excited to put these new ideas into practice over the upcoming eight to 12 weeks. And just as office hours were ending, my amazing boss, Tara Linsner, the Director of Homelessness Solutions, texted me and said, hang on to your hat, we start vaccinating at the shelters on Wednesday. So instead of the eight to 12 weeks, we had two business days. Welcome to the world of COVID, right? Well, that story provides a little amusing context for our experience. Now I'm going to jump in and give you some hard facts about how we operate here in Detroit. So we fund 14 year round emergency shelters and four seasonal shelters during the colder months. We have seven street outreach programs and two day center programs. We have received this year over $3 million in ESG funds and over 19 in ESG CV. We are a predominantly black and African-American community and those experiencing homelessness in Detroit reflect that. At our last count, we had 533 individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And as we were thinking about vaccine uptake, we were pretty sure that those individuals would be the toughest group to engage. Next slide, please. But that wasn't our only challenge. In mid-December, a survey came out saying that only about 32% of Black and African Americans in Detroit were likely to get the vaccine. Now, we knew that there were, there were and are current and historical systemic reasons for diminished trust of the medical establishment among Black and African American individuals. So we knew we had a challenge on our hands. We also knew that many of the people experiencing homelessness struggled with mental illness and were likely to be distrustful and suspicious of anything new in general. Next slide, please. However, we were fortunate in that we had a long-term existing partnership with the Detroit Health Department, and they had a team dedicated to those experiencing homelessness, and they provided pre-vaccine -va pre education events as well as on-site vaccine events thereby removing one of the biggest barriers to getting a vaccine. Next slide, please. So in addition to our work with the Detroit Health Department, we did some internal work ourselves. We did shelter focus groups. We learned about the fears and the concerns, and we really listened to the shelter staff, and, and they told us about the fears and concerns of the clients, the people that they serve. We did a lot of listening. We did provide, uh, we, we encouraged people and shelters to provide uh, incentives for education sessions, so like pizza parties and things like that. Um, some programs chose to incentivize the vaccine itself. And I think we, we all sort of have some conflicting feelings about those incentives. And uh, I would say I encourage you to know your community know your organization, know the people you serve as you're making those decisions if you haven't already. Um, and lastly, we worked with another wonderful partner, the Henry Ford Health System, to provide additional education. So, so we were doing, in, in 
the short time that we had and ongoing a lot of outreach and education. Through all of this though, one thing became very clear. The vaccine rollout had to be as low barrier as possible. And as we move into the next slide, please, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Blake from Pope Francis Center to tell us how her organization nailed the vaccine rollout. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, my name is Ann Blake and I work for the Pope Francis Center, which is a day shelter for people experiencing homelessness in downtown Detroit. We serve at least 200 people each day, uh, offering two nutritious meals and showers and laundry, medical and legal clinics, basic clothing and hygiene hygiene items. And our guests are predominantly unsheltered and chronically homeless. So we have hosted three vaccine clinics so far at our center and have been really pleased with the results that we've gotten. And part of our success, we attribute to the elements that are listed on this slide. Our guests told us that convenience was a key factor in their willingness to get the vaccine. They really liked that they didn't need to break their normal routine or go anywhere strange to get the shot. And even before we knew when or whether vaccines were going to become available for our guests, we began what is listed here as on-site education. So our staff began talking about the vaccines long before they were available. They made it part of our daily morning announcements, telling people every day that we were hoping to be a vaccine site. And our staff at every opportunity would say to our guests, I'm planning to get it, are you? Or if I get it, will you get it? And we had information about the vaccines sitting on all the tables so that while people were eating or hanging out, they couldn't help but see information on it. And our staff told me that they took time to address each person's concerns seriously and with, were very clear with everyone that there were no bad questions that they could ask about it. And our center director found some YouTube videos about it and uh, he used those to dispel rumors about the vaccine and showed these videos in our lounge area whenever people expressed concerns. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this slide shows what the health department's plan was for rolling the vaccines out. And to be honest, when I read this, I can see elements of this plan in how it really rolled out, but the reality for us was a little bit messier than this. Uh, initially, we were told that the health department would reach out to us when they were ready to schedule our site. And since we weren't an overnight shelter, this felt a little too vague to me. So I became a bit of a squeaky wheel, uh, emailing and calling everyone I knew, asking how I could get us scheduled. And finally, I got lucky and was talking to the right person at the right time. And she told me that they were looking for sites that were ready to administer shots right away. And I told her we were ready now and boom, we were giving shots out within 36 hours. Uh, the first clinic was very chaotic. Our vaccinators arrived an hour and a half earlier than we expected and uh, everybody um, wanted things set up in a different way. So we had to scramble pretty fast in the midst of our already busy operations to get things up and ready to go. Next slide, please. But once we were ready, we had our guests gather around in our big open area, and we had three of our key employees who interact most directly with our guests, our executive director, our program director, and our, the guy who greets everyone first thing in the morning. And they sat in the middle of the room, and we had a vaccinator next to each one of them. And then we made a, an announcement about how safe it was and how excited we were because this meant that the end was in sight. And then we did a big countdown, and then all three of them got the shot at the same time and everyone cheered. Uh, it really helped to build enthusiasm around the whole process. And so then our staff spent the next couple of hours walking around, encouraging everyone to get the vaccine. And right away, there was a big line to get the shots. And so a lot of our guests were waiting and some of them started to get pretty frustrated by the wait and were ready to skip out. So we had invited some of our most trustworthy long-term volunteers to help that morning. And we sort of assigned them on a one-on-one -on -one basis to the people who were thinking of bailing. So they stood in line with them and chatted with them and encouraged them to stay and help them, you know, get their arms out of their coats and ready for the shots. And we found that that uh, proved to be very effective. And we also had a couple of volunteers who were dedicated to helping people fill out the paperwork that they needed to fill out before they got the vaccine. And the paperwork was pretty complicated and confusing. So we just had volunteers sit with them and go over it line by line. 
Uh, we definitely saw that some of our guests wanted to wait and be the last in line so that they could see how other people did. Um, a lot of people did not want to be the first in line. Uh, after people got the shots and sat for about 15 minutes, we gave them a $5 gift card for a gas station nearby with a great convenience store attached to it. And we promised them another gift card if they would come back and get the second shot. We felt pretty conflicted about this. Uh, we are very aware of our, our guests' vulnerability, and we do not want to exploit them in any way. Um, but we had been told that this was a recommend, recommended practice, and so we went ahead and did it. And honestly, it really worked for us. Um, we also had a copy machine on hand so that we could make a copy of everyone's vaccine cards. Um, a lot of people expressed concern that they were going to lose their vaccine card before the next dose. And so this was uh, an easy way to alleviate that fear. Uh, the first day, we vaccinated more than 70 of our guests, plus our staff and about a dozen of our uh, most regular volunteers, um, the majority of whom are retirees and well over the age of 60, so they were eligible anyway. Um, this was about 50% of the guests that we had that day, so we were very pleased with that um, percentage of vaccinations. The second and third vaccine clinics were much more organized. The um, health department had fine-tuned the process by then, so everything went much more smoothly. Um, and on the second and third dates, we definitely saw what we were calling the domino effect. Once people saw that their friends had gotten the vaccine and hadn't gotten sick, they were much more interested in getting it themselves. Uh, so we had a lot of people who had refused to get it on the first round who were ready to get it on the second round. Um, the second day, we vaccinated more than 80 guests. And on our third day, a third um, clinic, we vaccinated 40 more. So because we are, uh, we predominantly serve this most vulnerable group of chronic unsheltered people, we were concerned about tracking guests and getting them to come back for the second shot. And so now we'll go to the next slide and I'm gonna pass it back to Stacy to talk about that. Thank you so much. And so this was our goal. Can everyone hear me? It's, it's difficult not being sort of with you all. I just wanna make sure that uh, I can be heard. We can hear can you. you. Yep, you're okay. good. All right. So our goal was to uh, to sort of track things so that we could find and remind, is how I view it, find and remind folks that it was time for their second vaccine. But you'll remember in my opening story, we didn't have a whole lot of time, and we were sort of behind the eight ball right from jump. And so things, we're still playing catch up. Things didn't go exactly as we planned, but we, the, our goal is still the same and we are slowly getting there. We are achieving that goal. Um, so it's a work in progress. And that's, that's what I can tell you. I, keep in mind that on the day that I sat in office hours, there was no guidance yet from HUD or HMIS or from our state or from our local CMC. So we really were building the plane as we were flying it. I know everyone's sick of hearing that, but that's really where we were at. Uh, next slide, please. So lessons learned, I, I must, say that when we look at what we've learned through this experience, a few things stand out. We could not have done this without the Detroit Health Department as a partner. And we couldn't have done it without the incredible work of all of our COC partners. Also, as uh, Anne pointed out earlier, vaccinating trusted staff before or at the same time as clients allows those clients to see someone else go first. Their safety in numbers especially with someone they trust. And so that trust building that, that gets done every day pays off on vaccination day. Also, I have to say this, communication and flexibility are the key. The plan is always changing and being able to pivot will make your vaccine program more successful. Next slide, please. If we had mobile vaccine clinics that we could send to encampments to reach out to folks who maybe don't even come into Pope Francis Center, um, that would be one thing that would be helpful. Better data tracking would be helpful, but we are well on the road there. And having staff enter data in real time would be extremely helpful. 
So as, as folks are listening and thinking, how, how can we do this as well? Because I don't know if, if Ann made it clear, uh, they vaccinated somewhere around 190 of our um, unsheltered uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness. That's, that's remarkable. So, um, so at any rate, um, having, having, you know, that, that tracking, having staff answer data in real time and having trauma informed, informed doctors and nurses would be extremely helpful. And I have this on our list of opportunities and it may be in, uh, we may be able to put it in our strength. There is some chance that uh, the health department will be continuing ongoing vaccine clinics at our sites for us. They had committed to doing three and, and from our latest information, they may be pushing that out to be an ongoing thing. And, and so as you're looking at this for your own community, these are things that I would say are, are the important things and, and the lessons we've learned. And now I, I, Dr. Blake and I would be happy to take any questions if uh, if that's appropriate, or we can stay on at the end, or you can email us. It looks like. So, thank you all so much. Thank you, Ann and Stacy, very much. Um, this was really great to hear. We know that a lot of this hard work is happening all across the country, trying to get our folks vaccinated, and we appreciate you sharing. Hopefully, folks are learning. Um, you know, picked up some ideas from you guys. I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any questions for you guys right now. Um, what I'll do is if you guys are able to hang on, um, as you said, we do have your email addresses here so folks can always reach out to you directly. So thank you for sharing um, your email addresses with us. Um, but what I'll go ahead and do is hand it over. Um, we'll go to the next slide and we'll hand it over to um, to Sharon Singer in the SNAPS office. And if you guys can hang on, Ann and Stacy, if people at the end might have questions, we'll be open for questions then as well. So for now, I'll hand it over to um, Sharon and she's gonna talk, give us a status update on where we are with some ESG um, grants and spending. Hi everybody. Um, I am here for our, our regular update, um, try and uh, show folks what's happening and um, I have some new numbers sort of hot off the presses and a shout out to Heidi Schilp from Cloudburst who helps keep us in the know with all of our data um, each week. So um, we have some slight changes from what I'm showing you here, but the good news is we definitely are seeing movement on funds getting committed. Um, and we're seeing a, a little less than 20% of the funds are being committed to do rapid rehousing. Um, about 27% going to shelter and other smaller slices going to housing prevention, homelessness prevention and outreach and other activities. Um, so we had 11 million since this reporting, 11 million additional dollars have been drawn over this past week. So that's 0.19 uh, billion. So, um, so we are bumped up to 4.8 percent of funds being drawn, but that is still uh, uh, still a small number that we are eager to see moved. Um, as we've been talking about, um, as you the funds are now over 50% uh, committed, and so that means you need to start drawing. So all, already those decisions have been made about what funds are going to be spent on. Um, so it's really a matter of getting those draws in. And as Norm has pointed out, you can draw every day if you need to, but you need to be drawing on a regular basis. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and we are also seeing a lot of movement, which is great about getting the funds, uh, grant agreements signed, and uh, also getting funds loaded into IDIS. So those are the early stages. and. Um, thanks to the field office teams who have been doing outreach on that. Um, it looks like we are getting close to getting all of the first sets of funds uh, into IDIS and we're getting close on the second. So uh, also Heidi points out that there has been a big jump just over this last month. Um, we've over $220 million has been put into IDIS 
Um, so we're really close. Um, only 400 million sounds funny saying only, but only 400 million still remain to go in. Uh, so we are really making a lot of progress and um, are eager to see that that continue. That is all I have for today. Back Thank to you, you Karen. Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. So what we want to move to next is we want to talk a little bit about the fact that we have another quarter coming to a close at the end of this month. Um, and you all have 30 days to do your quarterly report in SAGE for your CARES Act or ESGCV. So we have Michelle Budzik here from the Partnership Center. And she's going to do a little bit of review around the, um, the QPR in SAGE. So I'll hand it over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Karen said, on April 30th, the next quarterly report for ESGCV will be due. And we hope that you've all um, taken, a, the recipients have all taken a look at um, SAGE and their um, reporting requirements and are getting up to speed on making these happen. Um, again, the recipients are the states uh, territories, cities, and counties that actually receive the money from HUD, and those are the folks that report um, with the help of their um, HMIS lead agencies and victim service providers um, to give them their data. Next slide, please. In um, SAGE, you will see that we have um, updated guidance for you. There's a Q2 update that was also published uh, today with a link in your um, in the regular uh, weekly digest. And so you can get it either way there. This uh, bar is on your submission launch pad if you're an ESGCV recipient. And if you click Q2 updates, you'll uh, get the guidance there too. So we encourage you to read that. Next slide, please. We've updated SAGE with some gold stars to help uh, the recipients follow along with reporting. So, um, first of all, the reports requirement form, which is the where it says start here, ESG reporting requirements, has to be looked at every quarter. Um, if you started an activity or project the previous quarter, the boxes will be checked showing the activity or project. You won't be able to uncheck those because there's already a cumulative dollar entry and a cumulative um, service record, uh, the bundle update, and or an activity report for each one of those things you checked. So you'll just be adding to them if the projects haven't closed. But for every new project you start, new activity or component that you start, you need to um, check the box again. It's really, really important that you do the reporting requirements because it's driving a very quick review for HUD to be able to turn these around back to you faster. Um, and so it is, it, just good to do that. So we start that there on the submission steps. When you get to step three and you're entering your projects, you'll see that if you start, if you check the box for any one of these components, you're going to get a star on the tab to make sure you have projects entered in those components. If you said you expended funds, then you need to show the clients that were served and you do that by reporting the project and generating a bundle um, from the HMIS on that project. And then finally, you'll see the same star um, in the, on the financial form. So if you said you expended funds for homeless prevention on the reporting requirements, you're gonna see a star on that financial form showing you that there needs to be either quarterly or a total cumulative dollar in homeless prevention so that we know that you're um, on track for spending with homelessness prevention. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a perfect segue to how to use your ESGCV money from the vaccination that 
we just heard about. Um, HUD has added transportation as a um, for community-wide transportation for testing and vaccination as an ESG allowable activity. Um, transportation is allowed generally in um, street outreach and, and shelter for other kinds of things, but we're specifically saying that if you need to create a project in your community for vans or cars or buses or whatever to transport um, homeless folks from uh, multiple shelters or encampments into a testing or vaccination site to um, get them moving and get them through this, that is an allowable activity. If you do it as a community-wide activity, not an activity that's based in one shelter alone. If you do it as a community-wide activity, there's no HMIS data that's gonna be collected, and all you're gonna do is write a real short narrative on the thing. So it's, it's a pretty cool way to um, get your folks to a um, testing or vaccination center, um, just like was described earlier in this broadcast. Next slide, please. Um, we know that everybody has not started reporting or that you have uh, sometimes forgotten to report a project or you weren't able to report the project yet, your sub wasn't under contract or for, for multiple other reasons you couldn't report. So what do you do? Um, we've modified SAGE so that you can go back now and put in projects that you haven't, st that haven't started um, that's, that started earlier that uh, haven't been reported. So whether they started in the initial period before um, 9.30 or whether they started anywhere from October through the end of March, you'll be able to identify um, a project that you haven't previously reported on by adding it to the project page and SAGE will automatically put it in the right bundle based on the dates it started um, and you'll be able to add the financial information. You actually add the financial information in this quarter. And so um, whether it's you're reporting it this quarter. So whether the expenditure happened last year and you didn't report it or happened last month and you need to report it, it doesn't matter. It's all in this quarter. So generally you're gonna put this quarter would be for Q2. That would be the January through March time period. But we really want you to go back and pick up any expenditures that you haven't previously put in your financial information in this quarter. And again, um, expenditures is not equal to draws. So your amount in IDIS isn't gonna be um, equal uh, the amount you show drawn from IDIS is not going to equal this. This should probably be higher. Um, it, you can put expenditures in um, before you've paid the bill and before you've drawn the funds. So anything that your subs have expended or you've expended on ESGCV is um, what goes here. As always, um, we're able to assist you by answering your questions through the AAQ. Um, pick SAGE in step two, and we're happy to help you with your um, ESG CV reporting. And in, additionally, HUD will have office hours again on Q2 reporting. We're gonna do that Wednesday and Thursday of next week. The notice has already gone out for those between three and four. And um, we are, uh, we'll do this presentation with a little more information and, and depth for you, but we will also um, take your questions. And so please, if you have ESG CV reporting questions um, that you just, need to talk through with somebody, that's the time to do it. Thank you. Karen, back to you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm looking in the chat. I don't, um, oh, somebody's asking, hopefully you can see, can you go back to the slide, sorry, with the dates sorry, on the, um, the, the reporting office hours, they're um, Wednesday the 24th, 
and Thursday the 25th from 3 to 4 Eastern time. Um, one's for city county recipients and the other's for state uh, territory recipients. One thing before we turn off the subject of quarterly reporting, I just want to say, and it's, I'm just saying this because I've received two different emails from two different recipients um, this week um, because they, there was some outreach done um, as to their, um, their, their last quarterly report that we had not, um, was not fully submitted in SAGE, and they were under the understanding that it was submitted. And the reason they thought that was because their HMIS lead had helped them um, to upload the CSV file, which is the client level data, and they um, basically said, well, we submitted because you, you got our CSV file and it was accepted. Um, but as Michelle was pointing out, it's very important to, to do that first screen, um, the reporting requirements, and it's also very important because there's financial information in the QPR that we're looking for that gives us this expense information, um, things like that, that is not going to be in that CSV file. So if you're working with your lead and they're helping you and they're or even they're, they're uploading the CSV file, that's fine, but just know that that's just a portion of the QPR. And um, if you are being told that, that, you know, we don't have a full submission from you, that may be why. So we're following up with people individually, but I just wanted to put that out there because it seemed to be enough people were confused about that that I wanted to mention it while we had anybody on the phone. Um, it looks like we might have one or two questions about um, there's a question about can the HMIS lead attend the um, reporting office hours? Absolutely. Um, um, they can definitely. Um, I think there was one here. Sorry, I'm looking for the question. Um, oh, somebody's asking you, Michelle, if you can repeat what you said about funding for transportation and vans. Can we purchase vans for transportation for vaccines for the unsheltered folks? So the purchase question is not going to have to be a HUD question, but could you maybe go, can we go back to that slide so Michelle could, oh, we're on it. Okay. Thanks. So if you pick up the Q2 guidance, we've written um, extensive guidance about the different kinds of ways that you could fund transportation. Um, you know, one shelter could could choose to transport their own folks, and so how do you count that and how do you report that? Um, but this is specific for community-wide transportation um, is what we're talking about here. So instead of having everybody get on the bus and do an HMIS intake, which is absolutely not practical, um, we're, we're saying to you, you can, you can do a bus or a van or bus tickets or whatever you do for transportation if you're going to do community-wide. You're going to pick them up at multiple shelters um, and take them to their testing site or multiple um, encampments and take them to a testing site or shelters and encampments. The bus could just be going around and picking folks up. However you want to do that, um, that's an allowable activity. And we show you in, in the supplemental guidance how to, what at what point would you have to collect data, which is really when you're doing it out of a specific shelter or at uh, and what do you have to do to report? And I can't answer spending questions on transportation. Or at least maybe can. Yeah, Marlisa, do you want to take that? Yep. Yes. Uh, so you can pay for transportation for community-wide vaccine events under um, the street outreach component, essential services. So that's instances where you're not serving just one particular shelter or one particular outreach project, but it's sort of spanning a number of different projects and you're serving um, people experiencing homelessness um, from, a, from a variety of programs or projects. And um, if you are in the other couple of scenarios that we've included in the transportation guidance, if you are providing transportation for a specific shelter for a particular, the, the vaccination event that's um, targeted for a specific shelter, then um, that should go under emergency shelter essential services. Similar to um, a street outreach project that you may have ongoing and you would like to include transportation for those folks being served by the street outreach project to transport them to a vaccination event, that would also fall under street outreach essential services for, um, for that particular project. 
Thank you, Marlisa. Um, while um, we're not getting a ton of questions, but I will kind of summarize a couple because um, I think we get asked these every week about, um, well, first we'll start with the 2020 um, uh, COC award. You know, they were all renewed this year. Um, we made that announcement by notice earlier this year, and we are getting ready to train the field office on doing um, uh, grant agreements and getting all of those pushed out. So somebody had asked what the status was, um, you know, with grant agreements. Those should be, I think the field office will probably start, field offices will start working on getting those grant agreements done um, probably, I would say, early April. Um, that's my guess. So I think they'll be, um, they'll be available soon. You'll be hearing from your field office soon. Um, I believe there's also some questions about the YHDP NOFA. Um, no real updates on that. We are we anticipate getting something out this year, but we're still working through all the internal clearance processes. Um, I don't think there was anything else. Um, if somebody has questions about the um, some of the waivers that are expiring at the end of this month on um, March 31st. Um, we don't really have an update right now. Um, we just, we know we're expiring and we're looking to extend them, but we can't up, give any more of an update at this point. Um, the NOFA timing for um, FY21 COC NOFA, yes, it will be competitive. Somebody was asking if it was gonna be renewal like it was in 20. We do not have authorization to do that. Um, it will be a competitive NOFA and we're hoping to get that out um, late spring, early summer. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any other questions. We said we were going to go 90 minutes, but we may not. We may not have any uh, additional questions. I don't see anything. Let me see. Sorry, just bear with me while I look. If there's anything else, of course. I do not see any other questions. Brett or Marlisa, do you guys see anything that you think is worth mentioning? Because most of them were answered in the chat. <clears throat> that sounds right, Karen. Okay. Um, I just see uh, one question popped up. I will make this our last question, I guess. It's about the QPR. Our first QPR, quarter QPR was rejected because the amounts were different. That's a question. I would say um, put a question in the AAQ. Um, Michelle and her staff usually get those QPR questions and they can answer them very quickly for you. So it's hard for me to tell exactly what the issue is without having a little bit more information. But if you if you do have a rejected QPR and you're not exactly sure why it was rejected, um, definitely um, put, it, put a question in the AAQ and they'll get back to you pretty quickly. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up. Um, sorry it didn't take 90 minutes, but that means you get to you know start your weekend hopefully a little bit earlier. Um, so thank you to all of our um, presenters. Thank you for to our TA providers who always do a fabulous job keeping us on track and pulling all of this information together. Um, thank you, Ann and Stacy, um, Lindsay, everybody that was on the um, on the team. And I have to say. Happy happy hour to everybody because everybody was very disappointed that I uh, did not uh, call it call this a happy hour. So now everybody gets to start happy hour, hopefully a little bit earlier. So um, have a good weekend, everybody, and thanks for all the work you do. And we will see you next week. <laughs>